What is up, everybody? My name is Chad Brock. And I'm Zach Bailiff. You guys are watching the Orion Podcast, episode 25. Welcome back, everybody, to the Orion Podcast. We're going to kind of rush into this thing tonight. We've got yeah. uh, we've got a special guest. Um, really, probably needs no introduction to half of our kayak fishing crowd out there, but he's the godfather of the kayak fishing accessory game, and uh, we're happy to have him on our show tonight. So, without further ado, Luther Cypers. What's up, fellas? What's up, man? <laughs> After that introduction, I was wondering who the mystery guest was. <laughs> I was waiting on the, the Jerry Springer button he's got, and it, it, it was just a nice, quiet intro. It, it was. It was a nice, quiet sleep. You wasn't here last week, or last time, Zach, so no, me and Jim Sanders, man, we just, we just rolled right into this thing, so, but, uh, man, yeah, Luther, was... how are you tonight? Doing good, man. Doing good. So... Let's kind of let's kind of break into this thing real quick. And um, for those people at home that don't maybe know you or or know your story, how did you get started into the outdoors industry? Um, started as a, I guess you would say, a participant with some engineering background and manufacturing background. Um, me and my buddy Bob were fishing. Um, Chesapeake Bay, the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel for the Virginia folks. They'll know where that is. And um, just out there at night and, you know, where we were fishing, you know, you're kind of under a bridge uh, targeting fish that were that were kind of exposed in the light line. And you'd be fighting a fish and the current or the wind would just push you out into the, to the light where the boats were flying down the side of the bridge. So we, we, um, came up with a little homemade light and uh, the buddies at the boat ramp started asking for one. And pretty soon it was like, may as well, may as well right off the fishing trip. So if we start a little business, we could do that. And uh, that turned into, you know, after about a year, it was clear, or actually probably after about six months, it was clear there was a bigger opportunity there than I thought it was. And that's when I kind of really got serious about it. So looking back, what was, uh, I mean, what was one of the first products that really come to fruition or? It was the first one. It was the Visi pole. So it was, it was the predecessor to the carbon pro and it was basically right. a three quarter inch, um, essentially PVC pipe. It's a furniture grade PVC. It doesn't have any writing on it. It's kind of nice looking, right? Um, but it's PVC reacts to PVC glue. And we used to cobble together a tech type dive light and, you know, PVC pipe and some reflective tape and, you know, some eyelets and a flag. And we sold about 700 of those the first year and wow. made just enough money on that to tool up the Carbon Pro. The first product that made it a viable business was the VisiCarb. Wow. Um, you know, we, we when we launched that, it kind of about tripled the sales, something like that. And that's when it was like, OK, this could this could be something. Now, talking about the PVC pipe and all that kind of fun stuff, you know, we've had Jameson Redding on here, obviously Jim Sammons, Chad Hoover. Um, everybody kind of always, we always end up talking about the old days of rigging when we have the kayak fishermen on here. And everybody's super thankful for you. But do you, I mean, looking back, do you miss 
cobbling up any of those PVC contraptions that we used to, or is, is there like a hall of fame at Yak Attack with some of these OG <laughs> items somewhere? <laughs> all the, all the prototypes, all the prototypes. No, man, we're still, we're still cobbling <laughs> stuff together. We just get to do it with better tools. Now we were literally doing it today. We've got a new mount um, that we're uh, kind of fast tracking to production that will be, the world will probably find out about it. I think dealers found out about it Monday. Mm -hmm. uh, the world will find out about it shortly after that. It's pretty, pretty brand specific addresses a kind of a, a void in the industry, but we were playing with that thing today. All of us kind of crowded around and we started realizing, Oh, well, if we do this, we can just put an arm on it without having to use a lock and load, but you know, just take your toy and right. the thing together. And it's amazing how something that, you know, when it was first presented to me, I was like, yeah, we can do that in like a week. We are really fast with, with mm -hmm. uh, tooling. So it, it usually yeah. takes us much longer well, it always takes us much longer to design a product than it does to tool it. So I was, you know, I was like, yes, yeah, super simple. Like what were the original scope, but man, I don't know by now, but it never ends up like it starts. You know, the good stuff comes <laughs> along that path of development. And today was one of those kind of like, actually it started yesterday, kind of a lightning bolt. And then that spilled over into today. And anyway, it's, now it's super cool, but we were doing exactly what you're saying. We're just cobbling together whatever we had on the table and figuring out different things we could do with it. Just give me a box of parts and I'll, I'll build something out of it. <laughs> yeah. Hey, and and that's, I, I, I literally told John that today. I said, you know, it doesn't matter what we think of. if we, and Even if we can't see a need for this particular compatibility, we don't have to see it because I guarantee you kayaking works well. Oh, yeah. Right. I mean, kayak fishing is, I mean, it's been crafty ever since it, the dawn of its existence. And, man, you've probably touched about, every single kayak on the market these days with the rail tracks and the different things that you've got out there. Yeah. I, I think it's one of the reasons that, you know, as a, as an independent accessory brand, you know, we, we built a pretty good business and it's much easier than if you're a kayak brand building accessories, because, you know, it's hard to, pe people just aren't likely to put, you know, Ford parts on a Chevy Mm -hmm. um, so being kind of brand agnostic and, and, you know, kind of serving the industry as opposed to trying to, you know, protect a core kayak brand. Um, I think that's one of the reasons that we've been able to be as successful as we are. We're kind of have something for everyone. We try yeah. to. I would say that's, that's definitely fair. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I mean, shoot, you know, I've got. <laughs> 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 Guys, my screen froze up. Hang on one second. This is a video card issue. It should be back in a second. Oh, okay. We see you fine. Sorry. Yeah. No. I had, to, I had to close it and open it back up and then log back in. And then it's fine. It, it we thought you went down, man. He <laughs> 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 <You> fell down. <laughs> what just happened? Uh, hey, Stranger Things have happened on the Orion podcast. Just it's... I pride myself on quick naps, but they're never that quick. <laughs> this is a Jackson kayak product, a Ryan <laughs> Coolers product. We're not perfect by no means. Um, so as you guys are moving forward here, I know you've got new products coming out. When you when you're looking out at the future of kayak fishing, I mean we've come a long way since you guys first started putting parts out on the market. Um, the boats have continuously gotten better. Number one, did you ever think it would come this far? And like, where do you see it? really evolving to, I mean, what's, what could possibly be next? For the industry. Um, I'm not sure I ever had a mental ceiling as far as like where the industry would top out at. It's real interesting seeing your bows and stuff back there, Zach, because from the very early days of my involvement in the sport, it reminded me of archery, mm -hmm. you know, yep. and, and, you know, back in the, I guess it was the late eighties when I got into archery, you know, and the compound bows were just really starting to be a thing. You know, it's like this technological advancement that took a pr very primitive way of going out in, in, in hunting essentially right. uh, and made it a lot more accessible to a lot more people. And the, the sit on top road of molded kayak did the exact same thing. Yep. You know, kayaks and bows have both been around for much, much longer than the current oh, yeah. industries. <laughs> so you know, and when you kind of look at the numbers and you look at how, you know, how many people fish versus how many people hunt, it was clear that there was a lot of upside opportunity here. And it has that kind of hook the same way that archery does. For um, sure. 
so I never really put a mental ceiling on it. I knew it had a lot of potential um, to go really far. I also knew there were a couple of barriers, like bows are easy to put in a closet, kayaks aren't, you know, no. so people who live in apartments and stuff like that can be a little more difficult. But um, for our business, I would have given it a z- almost zero chance probability of becoming what it has become. Even even five years in, I, I would not have predicted this and 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 i think we will probably in the next you know few years we'll, we'll at least double this business again mm-hmm. yeah. uh, mostly within kayak fishing we'll probably branch out into some other you know watercraft fishing related stuff but um man it's a playground you know there's so much demand it's so much innovation the customers really care about the experience you know it's not commoditized yet mm-hmm. you know people are, are willing to they understand what it takes to build a premium product and they're, and they're willing to pay for the premium experience. And that's where we play. I mean, that's the only place we really want to play. Um, you know, we do try to find ways to bring the price point and the functionality together, you know, and sometimes you can do that better than others, but right. um, we do, we put the consumer experience first, you know, the service and the experience comes first and then we do, <laughs> do what we can on price. But, um, so it's a it's a really fun industry to play in because there's still a lot of real estate to be developed in, in in my view. Even for our brand, I mean, you look at the categories we're in, and you look at the 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 possibilities within the you know the sphere of kayak fishing. There's a lot of places I think we could add value that we haven't yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and it's I mean, in my mind, that's the right it's the right approach. I mean, it's kind of the buy one cry once, but at the same time, if a guy buys a mount or you know, some accessory that you make and it lasts him 10, 12 years, you're more likely to retain that guy as a customer. He's likely to come back and buy other stuff versus a $5 product off the shelf that he's got to, you know, go out and break in two weeks and come back and buy two or three more throughout the summer. Yeah. And we do try to put the customer first, Zach, but like, if I'm being completely frank, it's also a little bit selfish. Like Mm -hmm. we enjoy doing things that are really cool and really cool things are premium. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, we could have stopped with this kayak cart. John was just talking about it today. He was like, because uh, I need to maybe be careful here. But um, anyway, we were, <laughs> we were talking about some other stuff. And uh, he said today, he's like, you know, we could have launched this thing a year ago. It was a totally different product. And we kept seeing opportunity. We're like, well, let's develop that opportunity. And then by the time we got there, we saw some more opportunity. We said, well, let's develop that opportunity. So, you know, we delayed the launch a lot to get to yeah. where we are but i mean it is I mean, it's a seriously legit you know platform and you know that's what we like to do we have fun doing that we have more fun doing that than just oh yeah well you know we need to pick up x percent of revenue how quickly can we because and actually if we did that we could really make some hay with it for a couple of years because we're so fast mm-hmm. we're yeah. so fast and particularly with with like i said once the design is finished we can launch a product and just there's very few companies and I'm not talking about in our industry. I'm talking about in our country that can yeah, compete right. with, with our speed to, to market. But um, the development process is where we geek out and have fun. And, you know, we just aren't willing to leave a lot of meat on the bone, you know, yeah. but at the same time, sometimes as my, as my colleague that I started mag pump with told me, sometimes you have to shoot the engineer if you want to get it to market. So we have, <laughs> we also sometimes have to be like, okay, guys, that's enough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, engineers like to to reinvent things over and over and over sometimes rather than just saying, yeah, that's pretty good. Let's go (laughs) oversimplify, oversimplify. (laughs) Well, hey, Chad, that is the key right there. So, you know, and and people ask me sometimes, they're like, you know, man, everything you guys launch, like it really works. Like what if if people want to know what kind of training I have? I'm like, (laughs) 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 school of hard knocks, brother. But um. But what, the way I describe our talent skill at Yakutak, if you will, is I say we're exceptionally average. And what I mean by that is we think exactly like our customer. We mm-hmm. don't think differently than our customers. And then we're delivering these things that enlighten our customers. Like we think like our customers. We're very similar to our customers. So if it's cool to us, which we literally every day just build stuff that we feel like is cool you know, that's fun and, you know, good experience to use and intuitive and, you know, all that. Well, if, if we feel that way, our customer tends to feel that way. And it's not because we have some heightened sense of awareness. It's because we have the same sense of awareness, you know? So simplif- simplifying is often the best 
path to a great product. And I remember the early days, not just in kayak fishing, but, you know, I was designing machines and other kinds of products and different things before that. And if somebody looked at a, at a design in my early days when I was young and had something to prove, you know, and said, oh, I can't believe somebody else didn't think of that. I'd be like, hey, this isn't as easy as it looks. <laughs> Internally, I'm thinking like, hey, come on, give me some credit here. Now, when I hear that, I'm like, okay, guys, this one's going to be a ringer. Yeah. Because yeah. it resonates, you know, yeah. and, and what we're, the skill that we're trying to sharpen is to, is to scale our business without losing that. You know, that ability to resonate with a consumer and think like a consumer and be a consumer, be our customer, be an enthusiast in the sport as opposed to a corporation. Yeah, that's where our strength is. You know, and even it's funny, usually it's the it's the leadership in a company that's pushing towards standardizing and systemizing and all this stuff. And we're doing that. We have to do that to scale. You know, we got to get better at that. But what I'm preaching to the team all the time is every system we create has to work for our vision. Our vision should never work the system that we're creating it's just to facilitate us being able to do what we do on a larger scale you know and we can't ever lose this uh, willingness to throw it in the trash and start over you know it's like oh our strategic plan says we're going to do xyz the plan is important the ability to change the plan is even more important mm -hmm. you, you oh, know yeah. we and part of the reason for that for me and i can ramble about this kind of stuff all day long because i found it fascinating it's the same thing when you're developing a product. It's like, well, from here, I can see this far. Right. So I'll take the next step towards what I think I can see. Well, now I'm at a new vantage point. And from that new vantage point, I can see more or I can see mm -hmm. better. And, and every step you take during the road of product development or building a business or anything else, it's like that. And if you think that you can, from right where you're standing, see the end all be all, that's arrogance. <laughs> And it's unrealistic. Mm -hmm. And you're actually going to limit yourself by doing that. So we really allow ourselves to be flexible and to acknowledge that, you know, we have, we have, uh, again, we're exceptionally average. You know, we don't have the ability to plan two years in advance. So we plan a couple of days in advance. You know, we try to have a, a big plan, you know, that kind of tells us what our overall goals are. But the steps to achieve those goals, we, we're very seldom looking out farther than a week or two in, in a product. Very seldom. Um, and it, it, anyway, and it makes it fun. We make decisions every day. The team can collaborate every day. Everybody's input matters every day. And, uh, well, that, and that, that, that collaboration also, I mean, it builds morale within, within the group. If everybody's got a little bit of a say. It absolutely does. And, and it makes the products better. The best products we have built, you know, I get a lot of credit at Yak Attack for being a product developer, but Man, I'm gonna tell you, every single one of the best products that we built, you know, the Black Pack, the lock and load system, um, this new kayak cart, uh, really everything we've done for the last five years or so, you know, which is a lot of our best stuff. Um, there was another lead designer, you know, mm -hmm. I was guiding the process to a degree and collaborating and, you know, and helping it. I would say if I had to define my role at Yak Attack now, it's kind of like knowing where to go from here and knowing when it's ready, when it's ready. Mm -hmm. Um, but the skills to actually develop, it's easier to say it than it is to do it. And that is almost exclusively now coming from other people. Right. You know? So, so everybody matters like critically every day. And our team knows that. Now, this is kind of an off the wall question. What are some of the goofiest things the team has brought in or <laughs> someone like us that sit you up on Facebook or whatever and said, you know, I want to, I want a pizza oven to hang off the side of my kayak or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's What's the well, most ridiculous I've, thing that's come across the, the air? Well, a portable grill mount did come up <laughs> a while back. One of these Seems camping safe. grills. Um, man, get we get them all that. the time. It's usually not so much. There's been a few that are just way out there, but it's usually not as much um, out there crazy as it's just super narrow. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, I want something that does this. And it's like, yeah, but four people. Yeah. You really, and 15 really of your buddies. It. Yeah. Yeah. And, and people who might be doing the exact thing and then more than four, but you know what I mean? Like people who are doing that exact thing might really like it. But, you know, if people want to complain about, you know, the price of a $250 cart, wait till you give them a $600 custom <laughs> machine. Well, you see it. With oh, like yeah. some of the machine handles and stuff that are coming out. I mean, mm -hmm, yeah. people are paying as much for handles as they as they did for, <laughs> you know, the, the you know, a quarter of the cost of their kayak can go into two or three machine aluminum parts. So 
Yeah. You know, it's it's more of those kind of things that we run into where people want something, but it's just it's just too narrow. And, you know, we're our business has from day one been really focused on specialty retail as well. So we've got to be cognizant of what the dealers can handle. Yep. You know, because if the dealers get to the point, they're like, hey, we can't even support your product line, like 800 SKUs that do all these little yeah. individual things, even if we could manage to somehow do it and be effective and be, you know, cost conscious and all that, it would create a nightmare for the dealers. So yeah, try to figure out things that are, I think the best way to say it is, um, and we were talking about Pete a little while ago, Zach, mm -hmm. um, Pete's the, one of the ones who kind of put this in context for me. He said, you know, when, when we first met, he was kind of getting to know me a little bit. And he said, he said, you know, one thing I've figured out about you is you wouldn't do anything to hurt your industry. And that means you're going to make good decisions. And that's really the, the litmus test. It's like, is this good for the industry? If it's good for the industry, it's going to be good for our business. If it's bad for dealers, it's probably bad for the industry, mm -hmm. you know, in, in, uh, anyway, so that, that, those are kind of the rules we try to live by. The other thing is you, you end up with so many, like at any point in time in the, since day one, really, uh, well, actually I'd say a year in when we really started thinking beyond that one product, there's always been more opportunity than bandwidth. Yeah. So you, you're going to try to choose the ones that make the biggest impact, not just on the business, but again, what makes the biggest impact on the business is the thing that makes the biggest impact on the industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And that's, you know, it's funny you say it like that because that's one of the things that we've been talking about lately at AAE um, and some of the things we're doing over there is unless it makes archery better, we're not going to do it. We're not coming out with yeah. products just to have some gimmicky new product that, you know, got launched this year. I mean, unless it's making the industry or archery as a whole better, there's not a whole lot of point in it, you know? Yeah, man. And, you know, it's really hard to gain, like, I call it like benefit of the doubt status. Mm -hmm. So when we launch a new product, we, these days, we have the benefit of the doubt from day one, people, dealers expected to be successful. You know, our customers expected to be successful, the, the, the kayak anglers out there and our competitors expected to be successful. You know, there's this like expectation that if they brought it to market, it's because it's ready and it's because it's right. And it's going to be successful. You can make some short term plays that might be profitable in the short term because you don't make the investment. You don't take the time and you don't do it right. And you can get away with that for a couple of years. I don't know if you've ever read Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I quote that book all the time, but Stephen Covey calls it feeding the goose. He's like, people know not to cut the goose. At this point, people know not to cut the goose open and get the golden eggs out, but they forget to feed the goose. To do the things that created the capacity to do what you're doing requires like maintenance and care that might not be obvious. And even if you change it, it might not be obvious immediately that you changed it. But over time, you know, it, it'll really damage your brand. So mm -hmm. that's the other thing we do. And we've canned projects that just didn't develop to the point, even projects that we invested too heavily in, that never developed to the point to be worthy of the Akatak brand. Yeah, it's easy to lose the trust of your customer base. And once you do that, it's hard to get it back. It's very difficult. So we just we just hired a VP of sales, Joe Butler. He, he ran Black Creek Outfitters uh, down in Jacksonville. Joe's an amazing human being, excellent entrepreneur, business guy, strategic thinker, knows retail inside and out. He's been already just so pivotal for our business. But Joe told me when I when I launched Bonafide back a long time ago, Joe walked into the booth. He said, man, I'm here for a couple of meetings. I got to I got to leave in just a little bit. And he was like, I want to be a dealer. Do you have the territory? And I was like, yes, we we reserved it for you. And he was like, OK, I need to write an order, but I don't know anything about your boat line. I need you to write the order for me. I was like, you want me to write your order? <laughs> no problem. <laughs> and, and, he, and he leaned across the table and he said, hey, man, I want you to remember something. Trust is earned in drops and lost in buckets. Mm -hmm. That's good. And it took me a minute to even absorb that. And I, I've good. quoted that a hundred times, more than a hundred times since then, because it's one of the most profound statements I've ever heard. And it's so true. Yeah, that, absolutely. that's a good one. I need to write that down. Yeah, I'm going to have to commit <laughs> it's a good that one, one to memory. Man. That is, that's... Credit it to Joe Butler. That is, <laughs> for lack of better words, that's dang good. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, we've been focusing it. One of the exercises we've been going through at Jackson Kayak is what's your why? Um, the Simon Snack or however you say his last name, the whole ordeal. So curious, like-minded business people, give us the why. The why has evolved as the business has evolved. Um, it's not that. Like the core why hasn't changed, but there's new whys now that didn't exist before. Mm -hmm. The original why was, you know, I cut my teeth. So first off, when I was 
about 17 or so, you know, big surprise, you know, developed a rebellious streak, 17 year old, a teenage, you know, guy. Um, but I developed a really rebellious streak and spent, I don't know, two or three years just being stupid. You know, I'm really lucky that that didn't end poorly. Um, but I went to work at a manufacturing company, very entry level position and the ecosystem within that business and the mentorship and, you know, the coaching and the, you know, just learning about things. It changed my life. There's no doubt in my mind. It changed my life. I had a mentor there. His name's Chuck Patterson that took me under his wing way before anybody else would have even given, you know, I didn't, let's just say at the time, I probably didn't seem worth it, you know, but Chuck saw something there, you know, and he, and he, he, he was about, Chuck's about 10 years older than I am. And he had kind of been there, done that, so to speak, you know, and he could see the path I was on and who I was hanging out with and, you know, figured probably between the lines, you know, kind of trouble I was, I was getting myself into. And, you know, between all of that, nobody, it's not like when you're, you know, when you're at home and you've got parents and your parents are telling you what to do, it was more, you know, exposing you to opportunity and encouraging and, and suggesting and, you know, and training. Mm-hmm. And it changed my life. It really did. And then as I developed within that business, it evolved to everything's getting shipped out of the country. You know, this is when uh, oh, yeah. NAFTA had really opened the floodgates to Mexico. And, you know, the, the company that I was working for at the time, we had a plant actually one door down from the current Yakutak plant, but it was a French company. It was a worldwide company. So they were moving things to other countries where labor was cheaper. And so my last work for that company was helping shut the plant down and move it, um, which was good for my family because at the time I needed some work, but it wasn't a good experience. You know, it's just, it was heartbreaking. Right. And so I just, I just began to realize that like we're consumers, but we're not making stuff. You know, and, and I'm really glad to see in the last five or 10 years, like we've started to make stuff more. You know, a lot of yeah. things have come back. I think technology has enabled that. And mm-hmm. I think logistics costs and things have enabled that. But it started as that, like just kind of determined that we're going to do it here in the U.S. And then the other thing is I came from the automotive industry, which is like there's this brutal relationship between customers and suppliers to the point that, you know, the suppliers are not really always honest with GM or Ford. Because if you're honest with them, they'll just rake you over the coals with requirements and unnecessary burden and all that stuff. So I spent my last few years there, I was pretty influential in that business. So a lot of the times when we had issues, I was the one dealing with these, you know, these customers. And I realized after I left there, I was like, I was borderline professional liar. Oh. You know, like my job was to keep them sometimes from knowing the truth like that. <clears throat> at the time, it was just like it was the game. It was what I was trained to do. It was what we were supposed to do. But I realized like, that's not right. (laughs) Like that's literally not right. So it started as that, like, here's an opportunity to do things the way that I think it should be done. I think we should make stuff here. Do I see anything wrong with making stuff overseas? I actually don't. A lot of people misconstrue that. If if you want to make stuff overseas, do it, but own it and do it Mm -hmm. for a reason and own the reason. But you know, when, when, when it's like, you know, it's made overseas, and you're not willing to pay a living wage to, you know, to Americans, but that's your consumer. And then you're, you know, which we're lucky in our industry. We don't have a lot of the cannibalization of IP and stuff like that. We've got pretty respectful competitors. Um, but you, but like on Amazon right now, we've got carbon copy <clears throat> out of China. I'm talking about, I bought a roto grip because I didn't know if it was surplus that was ours. And yeah. when I put it in my hand, I was like, this is one of our early ones. But then I took it apart in the nut pocket that's molded in is for metric uh, nut. <laughs> like this is not our mold, but they scanned it because it's even got the same imperfections in the mold. I've seen and them. I knew yep. about that. So, you know, anyway, so it, it started like that. As it's evolved, I mean, we've got, man, we've got people working in our business that started in just like I did at Carbone. Actually, we don't have any people that were as stupid as I was when I was 19. <laughs> Literally, <laughs> not that I know of anyway. <laughs> but as far as starting super entry level, no experience, completely green, you know, and they're helping run our business now. You know, we've got people in serious, serious careers that when they came here, didn't even know what they wanted to do with their their careers. You know, so that has become more and more kind of a why as things right. have went on. We have actually demonstrated the ability. Now it's like a machine that's turning out products and benefiting an industry. And we're making stuff in the U.S. and we're creating jobs. 
but we're also creating like livelihoods, like real livelihoods. Like there's people who came to work for us in beaters and they pull up in their nice new cars now, you know, and they have raised kids and they're, you know, raising kids and they're saving for college and they're, you know what I mean? Like, Oh yeah. So that's become a big part of the why. Um, And, you know, it's always been also just my family. You know, I'd like to have some security. You know, I came from really humble roots and, um, you know, I appreciate that. I appreciate actually those are my favorite kind of people, practical, humble, just decent people. But, um, you know, we were, I, I live paycheck to paycheck most of my life, you know, including most of my tenure at Yakutech. It's only been the last few years that it's began to produce anything that you could even consider surplus. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, man, there's a lot of wise Chad. They, they have there. I, I can't say any have been replaced, but they've been added to as, as time has gone. Well, that's got to feel good knowing that you've built something that's not only supported your family, but it's created a family outside of the home and basically built a community around Yak Attack. It does. And it feels like a little bit of repayment of a debt. Like I said, Chuck, you know, it's a guy, Dave DeRazio, Shin Miami. You know, these are some of the early mentors that I had that created opportunity that took me from you know, I mean, for that place to hire me, and I think it was five twenty-five an hour. Maybe it was four seventy-five an hour for them to hire me. I had to go get my GED mm-hmm. because I didn't finish school. So, you know, for those guys looking at somebody, you know, with those kind of credentials or lack thereof, and saying, you know, I see something in this guy, and then giving me the opportunity, you know, to end up in an engineering department, and design these machines, and building a career and all that stuff. You, can't, you don't really go through that without, without feeling there's a certain amount of debt that you need to pay back, you know, right. oh, yeah. um, to the world, you know, to God, you know, to, to you know, just uh, if you get opportunities that help you, you should be able to, you should provide those opportunities to others given the chance. Right. Yeah. Paying yeah. it forward. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah, Google. that's right. We've both, uh, Zach and I are both in our endeavors, both have felt the same way for a long time. And we've, you yeah. know, we've always worked on that. And I always try to think about the kid, you know, that's, that's watching and, you know, tried to set a good example there. I think that's always important too. Um, so before we let you go, um, you've got to work with some of the, the most fun guys. We've talked about them, Jim Sammons, Jamison Redding, um, <clears throat> Chad Hoover. Who's been the biggest pain out of all them guys so far? <laughs> <laughs> um, man, everybody that you <clears throat> mentioned, I really have become good friends with, and I really like those guys. The one that I'd say I got off to the rockiest start with was Jim. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Because, you know, Jim's <laughs> got this, like, edge to him. And also Jim's a little bit intimidating, you know, especially when I first met him. You know, here, here's a – celebrity basically you know that i've mm-hmm. been watching his show for years and you know and i i guess i expected some sort of you know like uh i don't know warm welcome or something but instead like jeb just rode my like rode <laughs> me the whole trip you know everything from mimicking my paddling technique to you know giving me a hard time because he lost the rod actually he dove in and got it but he's the one who left the rod holder loose. <laughs> anyway, so it, Jim was, but once I, re, once I got to know Jim, he, he's one of the people I like most in this industry. Jim is a genuine and, and, and I, and I've, especially as I've gotten older, I have come to appreciate people that what you see is what you get. Mm-hmm. And Jim is a guy who will do anything he can to help anybody. He's a great human being and he's very direct, but he's also got a sense of humor. And I realized a little farther along that it was, a little bit more of a warm welcome. It was just the Jim Salmon's welcome. You know what I mean? Right. He was ribbing me just like he would any of the rest of his buddies. And I was being a little thin skinned about it. So, um, <laughs> you know, but, but like Chad and I, I mean, we started, we, the first conversation we had was when we were launching our product and I was trying to get people to, to, to give me some feedback before we did that. And he, he was the president of a Tadwater uh, fishing club, you know? Mm-hmm. So I'd reached out to him. He called me, he was stationed in Germany. It was funny. He called me. We ended up talking for about two hours. And I'm not kidding you. This is back in 2009. Mm -hmm. Actually, it might have even been the end of 08. I think it was before we launched. But anyway, he told me that he was getting ready to start KBF. He he was working. He had just published his book. He told me about 
kayak bass fishing. Back then it was all coastal. There was very little kayak bass right. fishing, at least in the industry. There were people doing it, but there wasn't an industry awareness of it. Right. He was like, this is going to, there's more air, miles of shoreline. There's more, you know, he told me all the reasons that kayak bass fishing was going to become the thing. Mm-hmm. He talked about catch photo release tournaments, which I'd never heard of and how they were going to, you know, one day we'll have hundred thousand dollar payouts and you'll see the BASS guys, you know, competing in these tournaments. And I mean, really everything that's happened since he laid out for me in a two hour conversation 14 years ago, 13, mm-hmm. 14 years ago. So you know, from day one, you know, I was like, you know, he's cool. We're both idea guys. So we had a lot of fun with that kind of stuff. And Chad helped us early on with making sure our products were relevant as we were getting to understand the industry. Um, yeah, I, man, we're, we're in a sport that's just full of great people. Even some of the people that I used to not get along with, um, mostly competitors. And really, if I'm being completely honest, that's because of, it was me. I was the jerk in that, most of those situations. You know, I was young and hanging on by a thread and overly defensive you know what i mean just just stuff oh, you yeah. have to learn when you're young oh yeah but yeah. um even though, i mean i don't there are very few people there's a couple of specific personalities that i strongly dislike um but not many right. all most of the people that i know in this industry and that i talk to um i've become i've become friends with most of them yeah i think that's saying that you know that's one thing that i think a lot of people don't realize is how much these brands actually talk. I mean, while kayak fishing has gotten bigger, we're still a relatively small niche when you look at the fishing industry and how big of a conglomerate that it is. Right. I mean, everybody still talks. Jackson talks to Hobie. You know, Bill Bragman, you know, that owned Yak Gear, uh, Bill and I, for the last two or three years, I mean, call each other on a fairly regular basis, you know, always sit down and, you know, talk at the trade shows and stuff like that. You know, we realize we're competitors, but we also realize that we're both good competitors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I think our industry has evolved to this like really, really innovative space where everybody is really kind of like fighting to do something better and different as opposed to, you know, just kind of like, you know, duplication and commoditizing and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And when you, that's what your competition's doing, you have a great industry because the, the sport's improving, the industry's improving, the opportunities for dealers and consumers are improving, and you're not just constantly stepping on each other's toes, right. you know? And and when you don't have good competitors like Yak Gear and Railblaze and, and, you know, some of the other ones, you have the bad competitors. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We've got some big brands that I won't mention um, in the sport that have just walked all over our IP and other things. Um, but we've, but even worse than that now is this, this, this carbon copy Chinese stuff that's starting to come out on, on Amazon. We're, we're figuring out now how to deal with that. Um, but, but yeah, good competition, uh, is good. And, and we all have the interests of the industry in mind and, mm-hmm. and the rising tide really does raise all ship. There's more opportunity out there than any one company is ever going to be able to capitalize on. Yeah. So, you know, you get a little older and more mature and you start to realize that stuff in the early days, I was sure we we're going to go out of business tomorrow that, they launched a product that could be, you know, or something, you know, I just was always <laughs> waiting for, you know, I, I, I refer to myself as a visionary optimist and a practical pessimist. We can do anything, but we're probably going to fail, fail tomorrow. Yeah. Right on. Well, yeah. it's, we're at uh, 38 minutes past here and I know you've got to get going here in like two minutes. So I'm going to let you, usually I say, thank the people you want to thank and all that <laughs> fun stuff. So you can thank whoever you want to thank, but leave us with, your two cents. <clears throat> My two cents, boy, that's a broad one. <laughs> hey, this is a, this is a Ryan podcast. You can be as broad as it wants to go. Well, the 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 thanks the the <clears throat> if you really boil it down to the you know the the folks that are responsible for our success, it's definitely the the kayak fishing consumer, the person who's out there on the water who believes what we're, in what we're doing and appreciates what we're doing and how we're doing it. And it resonates with our brand as much as they do our products, you know, with how we do things. And I can't tell you, especially coming from automotive where your customers hate you. Um, I can't tell you how amazing it is to be treated the way that we're treated, you know? So, and that's very also empowering for our team, you know, when they go on a fishing trip and, Canada and somebody wants their autograph because they were in a Yak Attack hoodie and they found out they work at Yak Attack. I mean, it literally happened to our engineering manager. Wow. That's where the thanks are. You know, the the two cents. Whew, gosh, man, that's that's a tough one. <laughs> My curious. two cents is 
if it's good for the people around you and if it's good for the neighborhood, it'll be good for whatever endeavor it is that you're trying to, to do. And I think a lot of businesses and even individuals, I think sometimes we get lost in the results and we forget about the, you know, the how we're getting there. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think in our country right now, in this particular moment in time, that's just advice that works in a lot of universal situations. <laughs> that's solid, yeah. man. That is solid. Yeah, it's absolutely true. Well, we appreciate you being on here. We will Thank let you, you go. And I hope that we can do this again and have a, uh, have another conversation. It's a, I feel like this could be uh, super insightful. Yeah. Let yeah, me know when, man. To, I enjoyed it. I appreciate y'all having two. me on. There ain't nothing. Yeah. You, you'll find us. We're always ready to talk about business and learn something. So, <laughs> <laughs> but we'll uh, talk about a little bow hunting too. Is that yep, we, we, talk we can absolutely that. do that. We can absolutely, absolutely do that. Well, Luther, thanks for being here, man. We will thanks, let you guys. go. Yeah. Thank good to meet you, man. Have a good evening. There you guys have it. Well of a guest. Well of yeah. a guest. No, that was a, a lot of <clears throat> info packed into a short period of time there. And I didn't like, I feel like I needed to write stuff down. Yeah. Yeah. More to be you know, yeah, for sure. For sure. There, there's more to be learned. Um, I feel like, yeah, conversation afterwards that we'll probably have is like, we need like that's like the headspace where we live um yeah the guys like that that have built well i mean for instance nick that i you know do a lot of work with and i mean what they have under one roof and a sixty thousand square foot worth of facility and they need another forty thousand square foot in, in a new facility just to expand and do the the things that he wants to do just talking to those guys and the things they've you know, done in the past and the product development and the R and D and the time that's went into what they built and, you know, sustained a U.S. manufacturing business is pretty awesome. Well, it's inspiring, man. I mean, you just, you listen to those type of people and those creative minds and, you know, hit like Luther hearing where he came from and how he got to where he's at. Mm -hmm. That's inspiring. I mean, you know, we've all been in situations. I feel like, you know, for where we're at, what we're doing, um, you know, a lot of it's, it's learned on own. You know, yeah, oh, there's yeah. been some schooling here and there, but it's been taking that initiative to get to that step, get to that next phase. And it's really incredible to listen to other people's story and, and feel inspired by them. Yeah. You know, it's, I mean, we talk about it all the time, but it's taken seven or eight years to get to where we are. And had we known what <clears> we know now, we probably could have done it in a week, 20, a quarter of the time, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Technology would have sped up. It would have been great too. Yeah. And I mean, just taking inspiration from a few different areas that we didn't know even existed at that point in time, I think. Oh, hundred percent, hundred percent. And seeing, seeing where it was going fully, I think would have been good too. I don't think we, we seen where it was going, but we didn't see totally where it was going at the time. Yeah. We didn't know exactly how to get there, but yeah, it's all learning, but I think, you know, trial and error, you know, somebody, Hearing it from somebody else and hearing their process of trial and error, I think is monumental and, and being able to get yourself there. And like I said, it builds you up, get you pumped. Yeah. Pumped super, for- super cool. And awesome to, you know, to hear how they started wanting to keep everything, you know, USA made and, and design <clears throat> right here. And, you know, ultimately built for, for the customers that do things just the same way they do. Well, and, you know, working in small companies and different things, you know, and, and building that family and, you know, when you hear your employer come to you and, and treat you like a family and to see your kids grow up and know your kids and the different things that goes into stuff like that, man, it, it's, uh, it makes you feel good about your job. It really oh, yeah, does. For sure. Yeah. That's, that's a big difference in, in working at a place like that. And some of the other places I have worked in the past, it's just, you know, you're a number, how much do you get done today? Yep. Yep. And that's, uh, it's good to see everybody's ideas coming to the page. I mean, that's, you know, whether it's a Yak Attack and I think some of the new boats that have come out of Jackson Kayak, like the Kusa X and stuff, you know, seeing everybody's ideas hit the floor and come together and merge into this one item is just freaking cool. Um, building the Orion Cooler, uh, some of the stuff that went into that, you know, you guys hear the backstory on that. Um, how do we make it better? You know, everybody's got a cooler. Everybody can go get a Coleman at Walmart for nothing. Yeah. Um, but how do we take a cooler? How do we make it better? How do we create, you know, American jobs with this cooler? And yeah, it's huge. It's huge. 
And it's that ideology that just takes it all to the next level. Yeah. You know, and I think as we see more and more manufacturing coming back here, you know, you're going to see some really premium products come out of that because, yeah, I mean, we're designing for us, you know, we're solving the issues that we have. We're not buying something that comes from overseas where, you know, they're just pumping stuff out to sell volume or something of that nature. Um, yep. You know, we're building products that are literally purpose built for what we want to use them for. Yep. hundred percent. So, uh, as we move on here, man, how was a, uh, you just got back from ATA this podcast in reverse tonight. I say just, just got back. It's, uh, I guess <laughs> it has been almost spread right out a week now. Uh, I feel like you just it, got back. It, it feels longer ago really. than that. It feels longer ago than that to me. <clears throat> um, no, it was good. It was, it was, uh, ATA as an organization, I think probably needs to change some things. Um, mm-hmm. attendance, attendance was down. It was a decent show, but it's not like the ATA of old where, when you right. agreed were with me the last time, um, not nearly that amount of people there. And I don't think, you know, COVID and all that stuff had anything to do with it. The, you know, last year, maybe, but not this year. Um, yeah. manufacturer, while they say manufacturer membership numbers are up, your big manufacturers weren't there. Um, Mm -hmm. Matthews wasn't there. Elite wasn't there. Hoyt wasn't there. Sitka wasn't there. Under Armour was not there. Wow. I mean, some of your big, big manufacturers like that weren't there. And, you know, I got to thinking about it and, of course, talked with a lot of different people. And the the cost for these companies to go do those shows, I mean, when you're, oh, when you're well over $100,000, $150,000 just mm-hmm. to bring in your your booth and your product and your team, travel, room, food, all of it. I mean, it's it's a very expensive trip. And yeah, these... if you can write those same orders <clears throat> while staying home, you know. Yeah. And, and two, Did back you? when you guys were going with me, ATA was where everybody launched their new product for the year. Right. Now it's well, all with, digital media. With digital media, social media marketing, all that stuff, it's not that way anymore. You know, guys are doing full on media launches with, you know, short films and a lot mm-hmm. of, you know, sweet photos and ads and imagery and campaigns, ad campaigns on, on social and stuff like that. But yep. everybody's already seen the product and, you know, they put in their orders when it was launched. So oh, 100%. why do they need to come to the show? So I think that's another thing that the, the organization needs to look at and say, okay, why do we need all these guys to show up to this show? What yeah. do we need to do to draw them here and keep the, you know, keep this show kind of what it is. It's, it's going to take some thought for them. It's going to have to be an experience for both the manufacturers and the dealers um, because it is a dealer only show. You'll get some media guys there too, you know, a lot of your TV show personalities and stuff like that. But mm-hmm. I mean, for your dealers, it's kind of a vacation. Um, and I think your manufacturers are going yeah. to have to to see some marketing opportunity from the show to to want to invest and keep coming back. Yeah, because I mean, that's what a lot of people don't realize is how expensive the booth space is for oh, these can the iCast, ATA, Bassmaster Classic, any of these big time events like this. It's expensive. I mean, yeah. not just like 10,000 bucks, like tens of thousands of dollars yeah. to get a booth. Yeah. Depending on the size of it, you know, I mean, with ATA, there's anywhere from a 10 by 10 booth up to, <clears throat> in good grief, some of those companies had massive, you know, 50 by 50 booths and stuff like that. I, I can't imagine what those, what those booths cost. I mean, for, oh, for a space that big. And, and most of the time when you see one that big, it's, Someone like Faradine, who's got seven or eight companies under one umbrella. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, it's it's going to have to change a little bit. Or, I mean, I don't see that show being around much longer, unfortunately. Yeah, and you know, I think that's it. it like I said, I mean, it's just the changing of times as we move deeper into a digital media area era. You know, everything's live. Everything's right now. I mean, companies can. We can sit here and launch a full product right here on StreamYard, yeah. what we used to to launch our podcast and have a conversation with the entire team yeah. and play the videos. And, you know, it's it's pretty incredible what we can do digitally now and touch more touch more hands and more of our audience at this at a keystroke. 
Yeah. And, you know, selfishly for what you and I do, I mean, as much as I don't want to see the ATA show go away because there's a lot of friends that I have from all over the country that that is the one and only time of year I get to see yeah, them and have you know, face-to-face conversations. Um, and I've done a ton of networking at that show over the years. I mean, that was my seventh or eighth ATA. ATA and I mean, pretty much 90 to 95% of the, the friendships and connections I have in this industry are because of that show. So, Mm -hmm. I don't want to see it go away, but at the same time, like with everything moving more digital, all more and more digital all the time and social media marketing, what it is and what we're trying to do. I mean, I was able to slip out of the booth and, and, you know, get to meet some new folks that I hadn't talked to before, uh, make some solid connections with, with companies I've worked with in the past. And 2023 is looking good for, for Hunt, Leet and Limestone Media. So, oh yeah, without a doubt, without a doubt. Well, guys. We're going to cap that off, man, um, for the 25th edition of the Orion Podcast. I don't know how many actual episodes we've got up on the channel, but without a doubt, you guys should head over to uh, Spotify, Amazon, Samsung. Give us a listen, Orion Podcast. You can go back through all the uh, previous episodes of the Orion Podcast and Jackson Kayak Doc Talk um, under one roof. But, one of these uh, days, I'll get that Apple Podcast thing figured out. <laughs> yeah, one of these days we'll get there we'll get there if apple podcast is listening we need help we are <laughs> we failed to negotiate that term and if anybody wants to you know come on and be our it guy um <laughs> in, it, it, it doesn't pay us, well <laughs> it doesn't pay well but you can email us at info at limestone media and um we'll get you taken care of um with that being said uh we got to thank the people that make this thing possible every week or every other week it is jackson kayak uh you can visit jackson kayak at jacksonkayak.com head out to your local dealership demo a boat try it out and see what everything's all about most of all ryan coolers which is part of the jackson kayak umbrella um can be found at jacksonkayak.com uh super stoked man these coolers are inspired outdoors and they inspire us to keep moving keep us uh keeps grinding out on the road or in the on the trail or yeah. heck, man we've had like tons of ice fishing stuff here coming up on the uh, socials here lately so yeah wherever you want to go orion can help you get there lastly new to new to the list new to the list we got z pro batteries uh helping me and zach out this uh summer um going power us uh power our boats up and get us through some uh, kayak fishing trips i'm hoping so yeah okay. yeah we got uh so shout out to z pro new uh check them out zproblithium.com pick yourself up cool battery they're good they're good i'm very impressed with them so yeah everybody have a good night yeah but <laughs> i'm gonna what's i'm gonna leave my two cents can we leave our two cents uh, i don't know how many cents i go with inflation my two cents is worth uh i got like a whole lot but i'm gonna give i'm gonna give three worded two cents remember <laughs> oh, yeah it's gonna be more than that Remember to bake in the wow. <laughs> <laughs> I, I yeah, I'll leave we'll leave we'll leave it at that because I, right. I got nothing. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks for watching, guys. We'll see you at Jackson Kayak Doc Talk Thursday night. Come hang out with us right here, Jackson Kayak YouTube and Jackson Kayak Facebook. Got it. There it is. There it is.